Our scripture today comes from 1 Peter chapter 3. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Thank you, Lisa. Good morning, church. Good morning. How are we doing today? Yeah? Yeah, you sound pretty good uh, today. I'm feeling just fine. You know why? Because it's pumpkin spice season. Yes, it is. Fall is officially uh, arrived, uh, arrived now. I am certain of that. I appreciate the pumpkin uh, reference this morning. There was this popular uh, meme that came out on, on Facebook this week about how the key to building God's kingdom is pumpkin spice communion wafers. And I had, a, <laughs> I had at least a dozen of you send that to me. You know your pastor well, and he's feeling appreciated during Pastor Appreciation Month. So uh, thank you uh, to all of you for, uh, for your kind words and, and for your cards. Uh, that means more than, than you know. And it is truly my joy and uh, my life's honor uh, to be appointed among you and, and to serve you. So thank you uh, for that. How are we doing on the Disciples Path? We're rounding turn four. This is the last week of our Disciples Path uh, series. Are you finding your way on the path yet? Are you feeling like you're getting on board yet? Nobody. <sighs> we, got, we got 25 more minutes, Ken. You're going to have to, <laughs> you have to hang with me. You know, I, I do... Uh, I do have to say that this has been an incredible series uh, uh, for me because what I've enjoyed about this is that I think this series gets at the heart and the very core of the gospel itself. We've learned over these last several weeks that a disciple is one who, is a person who wants to follow Jesus, right? Whose life is centered on following Jesus by loving God and loving their neighbor. And Jesus qualifies being a disciple. He says, if any of you want to be my disciple, you must first deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. So this series gets at the heart of what it truly means to be on the path of discipleship, to be following uh, Jesus by loving God and loving our neighbor. Now, every Christian church who claims Jesus is Lord will say the central concept of the gospel is loving God and loving neighbor. And do you know why? Here's a spoiler. Because Jesus said so. <laughs> right? I mean, it's no secret. Jesus says the entirety of the law. You can spend a lot of time reading this and studying it, but it all comes down to loving God with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving your neighbor as you would yourself. Now, every church claims that, but mo a lot of churches look very different from one another, don't they? Not in just like their worship style, but how they really live out the core foundation of that gospel. So what we're doing the last six weeks is we're getting at the heart of what that looks like in the United Methodist Church. And we know that if we're on the path, if we're on the path of growing in our discipleship, in loving God, and loving neighbor, and following Jesus, that we have to be hitting five waypoints on that path. And I hope you're familiar with them at this point. I told you there wouldn't be a test at the end. I promise you that, but I'm curious. Do you know them? It's our what? Our prayers? Our presence? You're getting it. You're getting it. You, it sounds like most of you are arriving on the path, and that's, that's, that's wonderful. Um, I want to uh, welcome all of our friends and our visitors here uh, this morning as we dive into the fifth waypoint this week on witness. You may remember that you were invited to invite a Fran with you to worship today, which is a friend, a relative, an acquaintance, or a neighbor. So I want to invite you, whether you invited a friend or not, find, find, find a friend, find a neighbor, find an acquaintance if you have to when you go to the gathering space today. Take a selfie holding this sign. Post it to your social media. Check in at First United Methodist Church and hashtag it uh, Fran. What a great way uh, to show your witness uh, to the world this morning. So I invite you to join me as we begin talking about a dirty four-letter church word called witness and evangelism. So will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, most gracious God, we come to you today, we worship you, and we praise you. We offer you all that we have and all that we are. We know that our witness ultimately comes from an outpouring of love that has welled up in us that we can't contain it anymore. 
We ask for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit today, that it would fall upon us, that it would guide us in the directives of Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and can offer us new life and unlimited possibilities. It's in his name that we pray today. Amen. Amen. You know, Proverbs say, grow your, grow your children in wisdom, and it will follow them all of their days. You familiar with that, with that passage? I had an incredible experience this week. I was at the Nissan dealership as Liz was getting her, her oil changed in her car, and I told her I'd meet her over there. So I drove my truck over there and was searching for them uh, on the lot, and Addison was in the back seat with me. And what happens within 10 seconds when you drive onto a car sales lot? <laughs> Right? You get bum rushed by like five different salespeople. And I had a guy come up, literally knock on the window of my, of my truck as I'm looking at these t big Toyota Tundras as I'm searching for Liz. It doesn't take much to distract me. Right? And, uh, and uh, he starts telling me about these Tundras. And, and uh, <laughs> you see, you know, Addison rolls her little, her little window down. And she says to the salesman, hey, do you like my daddy's truck? She's, he says, oh, yeah, it's very nice. She's like, yeah, you should. It's a Ford. <laughs> Raising them right. Raising them right. You know, it's incredible. Uh, trucks are a big deal in my family. I, I purchased a Ford, and I wasn't sure that I would be invited home for family Christmas uh, that year I did that. My dad is a, is a Dodge man. We have others in our family that are, that are, Chevy, that are Chevy people. But it's amazing. You get people talking about their, their, their trucks, particularly uh, some of the fellas, and oh my gosh, do the passions rise. Does, does the tempers even sometimes uh, begin to flare as we start defending uh, our honor? You start talking about your favorite sports team. And holy cow, does the, does the passions rise and people are just dedicated and sold out to, the, to their teams. And then when it comes to sharing our faith, <laughs> oftentimes we as the church, we remain silent. We tend to be more passionate about our vehicles and about our sports team than disclosing the good news of the triune God. And I ask you this morning, why is that? Why is that? Why does that happen to us? There's a man by the name of John Wesley, the founder of the United Methodist Church, who said, always be ready to preach, pray, or die for the sake of the gospel. Preach, pray, or die for the sake of the gospel. When I was serving First United Methodist Church in Marion, one of my first Sundays there, Pastor Mike Morgan leaned over to me as I was his worship leader that morning and, and reading scripture and assisting with, with a part of the service. He says to me, you got your sermon in the bag? I said, what do you mean? He's like, you always should have a sermon in the bag. Always be ready to preach, pray, or die for the sake of the gospel. My first thought is like, I hope it's in that order. Right? So he says, one of these days, I'm going to lean over to you, and I'm going to say, you're up. And you're going to be preaching that Sunday. Get your sermon in the bag. He tells me how when he was a, a young pastor about my age, how he was appointed as an associate pastor, and the lead pastor leaned over to him and said, you got your sermon in the bag? Mike said, what's that mean? The lead pastor says, always be ready to preach, pray, or die for the sake of the gospel. And you know what Pastor Mike said? I hope it's in that order. <laughs> Always be ready to preach, pray, or die for the sake of the gospel. What would compel John Wesley to live that way? Was he a religious nut? Was he a religious fanatic that he would be ready to die to tell this story, to tell this good news? I got to say, my friends, we don't, we don't share the good news of our salvation out of fear or, or out of obligation. Ultimately, it comes from, from a joy that has welled up within us, that we've encountered this, this love that has transformed our lives, that has transformed our heart, that has set us on a new path, a new directive that is so exciting and so compelling that we can't hold it in, that we can't contain it any longer, right? All of our decisions that we make in life, sociologists will tell us, stem from a cost-benefit analysis. Right? We choose A over B because ultimately A is going to be more beneficial to us. Right? Ultimately, we begin to evangelize because the joy, the joy in the Lord is so profound. And we have this compulsion that others have to know why. Your joy will ultimately begin to outmeasure your fear in sharing 
the gospel. We got a little witness down here this morning. This is great. This is great. I want to direct your attention to 1 Peter chapter 3, our teaching text for this morning. It says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be what? Prepared to preach, pray, or die for the... It doesn't say that, does it? Always be prepared to give an answer. How's that? Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness. Do it with respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. What does it mean to joyously give an account? Today, it's my hope, it's my prayer that we recapture our joy in sharing our love story with God with someone else. You see, our witness, our witness, this final waypoint on the disciples' path, it's not an option for us as Christians. In fact, it's, it's commanded by Jesus. In Matthew 28, we've read this verse last week, referring to this as the Great Commission. Commission means sending, to go. Jesus says, therefore, go. Mm, therefore, go. therefore, go, go. go. And make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Remember, remember this, my friends, Jesus says, I will be with you to the very, very end of the age. This is why witness is one of the pillars, one of the waypoints of our membership in a church, the United Methodist Church. And quite frankly, if we've encountered this transforming love of God, this grace in Jesus Christ and the fellowship, the presence of the Spirit, we, can't, we are compelled to do nothing less. We're compelled to do nothing less. This oftentimes is referred to as witnessing, right? Witnessing. So this is going to be a bit of a dialogical type of sermon today. Whoever's running the camera, I apologize to you, but I'm going to be moving around a little bit. I'm curious this morning, what does the word witness mean to you? when you hear it in a churchy context, right? What does the word witness mean to you? I'm curious, anybody? What's that? Tell to tell your story. A testimony, okay? What does it mean to, what does it mean to witness? Can I get a witness? What does that mean? Testify, I heard testify, testimony, all very churchy words, right? Very good things. What's that? Share the good news from Sam. Speak the, speak the truth. Okay. You all buy that? Say that again. I can't hear you. Experiencing it. Uh huh. Any others? Okay. So we hear we hear witness. Now, what is evangelism? Anybody? Euler. The same thing. Witness evangelism. Very similar, right? Very synonymous with each other. You know, when it's been my experience that when we talk about this concept of witness and evangelism, for many of us, it's kind of become, uh, you know, witness and evangelism is a, is a long word, but for many of us, it's become kind of a four-letter dirty word <laughs> in the church. And oftentimes, that has become because many of us have had a bad experience, right, with someone witnessing and evangelizing to us. Anybody resonating with what I'm talking about right now? You ever been, been through that experience before, right? Right? We often at times associate witnessing and evangelism as a, an oppressive act that, that we have, have to do. And oftentimes I think we become resistant to the idea of sharing our faith because we say, well, you know, man, I, I just don't know enough about the Bible. You know, I'm not confident enough in my knowledge of the scriptures to go out and give a, give a credible testimony. Per, perhaps for you, you don't want to hand out, hand out Bible tracts to your waitress instead of a tip right? Maybe that doesn't sound very compelling to you. Perhaps dressing in a white shirt and a black tie and knocking on people's door at 8 a.m. on Saturday morning does not sound to you like a good time. And I would echo most of those things don't sound like a good time either. That's okay. Witnessing can look like those things, but it's certainly not limited to those things. I want to invite you to consider the type of people that God used 
to spread the, the good news, right? To make God famous throughout the Bible. Listen to this. I don't know who penned this. I don't remember. It's not my own, uh, my own words, but I think it's beautiful. Think about this. Noah was a drunk. Moses was a stutterer. David had an affair. Jacob was a cheater. Abraham was too old and a liar. Thomas was a doubter. Peter had a bad temper. Sarah was impatient. Jonah was afraid. Paul was a murderer. And Lazarus was dead. <laughs> he was dead. Point. You don't have to have your faith completely figured out to be a credible witness, just being open and willing to follow where God leads. My point is this morning, God uses ordinary people like you and me to do extraordinary things, sharing this good news and this, this message. I want to invite you to turn your eyes to the screen as we get a witness from the skit guys this morning. I think it's no wonder that for some of us, evangelism and witnessing has become a four-letter church word. Am I right? You ever been through one of those experiences where you're having a theological conversation with someone and uh, what tends to happen in the midst of theological conversations, there's oftentimes <gasps> disagreement. Shocking. And oftentimes, the, the compelling resolution is, well, if you don't believe what I believe, or if you don't get on board with what I believe, you know where you're going, right? Have you ever been the victim of that type of evangelical experience? I have to say that I don't feel that that uh, conveys the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit as we see witnessed in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. See... Being, being the loudest voice in the room doesn't necessarily make you the right voice. It doesn't necessarily make you even the most uh, compelling voice. That type of scare tactic evangelism is ineffective, first of all. What, what, what weight does the, the power of hell have over someone who doesn't even profess a belief in God in the first place? It displays God as some, some sort of bully that's out to get you. You understand what I'm saying? That's all it does. Here's my point, my friends. In our witness, in our evangelism, you can't scare people into a relationship with God. Nor should you. Now wait, pastor, but doesn't the Bible say to fear the Lord? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Which is a bad translation of the Hebrew, actually. The Old Testament was originally written in the Hebrew language. Fear of the Lord can also be translated as revere and awe. What if our, in our approach to evangelism was not casting people to fear the Lord, but rather to be in awe of the Lord, to be in reverence of the Lord? How would that change our approach to evangelism. And here's a second point, my friends. Christ did very little standing on street corners and proclaiming the gospel. You know what he did? He seemed to eat a lot with sinners. He seemed to go where they went. He seemed to invite himself into other people's company. He went where they were. He slept where they slept. He lived where they lived. He met them at their level and met their needs where they were at the time. And in the transforming power of the Holy Spirit, no one was left in that place. You know, when I was first becoming a, a pastor, um, I, I, remember my, uh, I remember preparing for my first Easter Sunday sermon. I don't remember the sermon itself. Apparently, it was really compelling. Um, but I do remember preparing for it because I was living in Dubuque at the time and commuting to Marengo, which was about two and a half hours away. So I knew that on, uh, the, through Holy Week that I was going to be staying in the parsonage, which we hadn't moved into yet, which was empty, which meant I was sleeping on the floor with blankets and, and a pillow. But I remember on Saturday morning going to the church, getting ready for, uh, to prepare my message, and all of a sudden I looked up at the clock, and it was 10 o'clock at night. And I realized, man, I, even, I haven't really stopped. I haven't even eaten. And I was in a small town. And what is the only thing often open in a small town? It is the gas station, right? And it's Casey's Pizza. 
in Marengo, Iowa. I remember going into Casey's Pizza that night. At 10 o'clock, the cashier looked at me and said I didn't look drunk. I said, well, oh, okay. He's like, well, most people coming in here to get pizza this late are actually just soaking up their suds. You don't, you don't, you don't look intoxicated at all. I was like, no, I'm just, I'm just hungry. You, what, do you recommend anything? He's like, I recommend the taco pizza here at Casey's. I was like, well, here's something you have to understand. I'm a Quad City boy, and that is home to Happy Joe's Pizza, the original taco pizza. I want to dispel the myth for all of y'all this morning. I said, you, you, got your, you got to really step up your game if you're going to beat Happy Joe's Pizza. And he starts talking about all these ingredients he's going to do and how he's going to doctor it up a little bit for me. I said, okay, well, that's cool. He's like, but wait, have you tried the cheesy bread here at Casey's? I was like, no, I've never, I never had the cheesy bread. He's like, it's amazing. We slather this, this garlic butter on it, and it's got an overwhelming amount of cheese. It's amazing anyone survives when they eat this at all, he says. It's fantastic. He's like, but for you, I'm going to hook it up. I'm going to throw some buffalo sauce on it. I'm going I'm to make it incredible. I took my pizza home that night. I ate it. I don't remember what I preached about on Sunday morning. Apparently, I was comatose by cheesy bread. <laughs> I walk into the gas station two weeks later, and the guy calls off, hey, cheesy bread. He started calling me cheesy bread. And every time I walked in that gas station, that's what he called me. Until, and we began striking up these, these conversations. I began to learn a little bit about his, about his family and, and about how his wife Meredith was, was going to school part-time and working two and a half jobs trying to, trying to provide and him doing the same thing while he's working at the gas station here in town and how he's got these two, these two small kids. And then yeah, about six months later, he says, Matt, he finally learned my name. And he says, Matt, what, what brings you to town? You seem, you don't, you, don't, you don't live here, do you? I was like, I'm actually the preacher at the Methodist church down the street. He said, shut the up. <laughs> he did not believe me. He said, you're a pastor. I said, yeah, I'm a, I'm a pastor. He said, but you're so down to earth. I said, so was Jesus. Jesus is literally God's down to earth. You know what? We began, I, 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 at that point, because I had a relationship with him, I began to tell him that, you know, you, maybe you just want to come and check out our church sometime. You know, it's on Sunday morning. Here's a service times. You know, I'd love to see you sometime. Next week, I see him in church. And six months later, I am baptizing him, his wife, and his two daughters. And you know why that is? It's not because I'm an awesome, shiny evangelist. It's because I happen to like cheesy bread. <laughs> and I was in the right place at the right time. And God offered up an opportunity to witness and to share the good news. See, witness is more about the art of attraction, less about the art of persuasion, my friends. He began to realize that I, it, it's, it's not that I had all this Bible knowledge, it's that I had all this biblical passion for the one who has transformed my life. And I began to share that kind of story with him. And he began to get excited about the possibilities that, my gosh, if this screw up can be transformed, perhaps there's hope for me too. And lo and behold, the Holy Spirit began to do a good work on his life. You know, I think the, the other problem with our witness oftentimes is this thing that I call false advertising, right? When we buy a product, when we, when we purchase an iPad, we expect that iPad to turn on and work. When we, when we open the box, we expect products to do what they say that they're going to do. And often, to, and our faith is the exact same way. Take a look at this Gillette ad real quick. The Gillette Magna Core Extreme, complete with 80 blades. I have to tell you, if you bought this product, you might be a little disappointed when you open the box. Have you ever seen a razor with 80 blades on it? No. No. You see, people hear from time to time this good news about what, what the church is, about what Christians are supposed to be, what Christians are supposed to do, and what Christians are supposed to look like. And when we don't live that way, that is the most compelling reason for people not to want to fall in love with Jesus, my friends. It's false advertisement. I want to give you a quick description 
of what the early church looked like. Right? This is, this is right after Pentecost, and, and, the, and, and then the church is beginning to spread. Listen to this description. They, meaning the disciples and the apostles, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Awe came upon everyone because so many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had things in common. They would sell their possessions and their goods and distribute all the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread in their homes and they ate food with glad and generous hearts, praising God, having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. That's the description of the church, my friends. I want to invite you for 30 seconds to close your eyes with me for a moment. Just close your eyes wherever you're at. And I want you to imagine for a moment that you are on a deserted island. And it is nothing but blue skies, white sand, and emerald green seas as far as you look. There's no one around. You are on this island by yourself. You have no earthly possessions whatsoever. None, except for the Bible. And you open to this Acts chapter 2. No one has ever witnessed to you before. You have never been to church. You have never experienced the transforming news of God. But you read this Acts chapter 2, the description of the church where people were devoted to to prayer, and they were laying their possessions at the, at the feet of the disciples so that there was no needy persons among them, where people are gathering each other's homes with glad and sincere hearts, where they're breaking bread together, and the Lord is adding to their number daily those who are being saved. That is your only description, your only knowledge, your only witness of the church. Now I want you to think of what is the church today? And I want to ask you a question as you open your eyes. Are they even close? Are the two descriptions even close? And if they're not, can you live with that? What are we willing to do, my friends? Right? When we don't live into our kingdom potential as the church, it is not a credible witness to the world, my friends. Witnessing is not primarily about what we say. Witnessing and evangelism is not primarily about what we say. It's primarily about what we do. Look at James chapter 2, a verse that I hope is familiar with you. Faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, if our beliefs are not echoed in the way that we live our lives, display the good news and transform the world, faith itself is dead. It is not useful to us at all. I had a great conversation this week with with Mark Fransdell as we got together and we were talking about uh, what was going on in each other's lives and most of you know that Mark is a is a lawyer here in the in the Cedar Valley area and I love hearing him talk about the artistry of what happens in the courtroom right he's he said uh, he was telling me that the, the, do you do you understand what the role of a, of a witness really is I said explain it to me he said, well, the role of a witness is not to, not to argue the case. That, that's the attorney's job, right? He said, it's not the, the role of the witness is not called to decide for anyone else. That's the, the jury's job. It's not in the business of, of judging anyone. That's not the witness's job. The witness is only freed to articulate what they saw, what they heard, and what they experienced. And this is what the witnesses in the book of Acts truly did, my friends. They gave an account in such a way because they experienced the Lord in such profound ways that it welled up in them and they couldn't contain it any longer. They were ready to preach, pray, or die for the sake of the gospel, ready to make an account of their own faith. 
not out of obligation or out of duty, but simply because they had experienced this profound joy in the Lord. What if our witness, what if our evangelism came from a wellspring, an outpouring, an overflow of our own hearts, from the joy that we have experienced in Jesus? What if that was where our story came from? What if witnessing was not so much about knowing the scriptures front to back, but it was more profoundly rooted in sharing our own personal experience? What we saw, what we heard, our own love story with God. My friends, I bless you and send you out the same way every week. I hope you hear these words profoundly today, that you may know the love of God, that you may know the grace of Jesus Christ, that you may experience the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And as we go and bear witness to this good news, all who find that as a stranger, may they find in us generous and gentle friends. The service is over. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen. This has been a broadcast of the First United Methodist Church in Cedar Falls. We're glad you joined us. We're here to help you on your journeys of life and faith. We gather for worship services and classes, support groups, and just for fun groups, and you're welcome at any one of them. Just show up and say, hi, I'm new here, and we'll take it from there. You can learn more about our church at aboutfirst.com, and you can follow us on Facebook and YouTube, too. If you can't make it in person, we'll be right here on your TV at this same time next week. We'll see you then.